Let me just a uh, brief uh, introduction. John, John and I have traveled uh, yeah. extensively Thank through you. the years uh, with the Voodoo Contest uh, group uh, to a number of West African countries and uh, in more recent years to uh, the Suriname and uh, uh, one stop in Cyprus along the way. And uh, we were PJ2T together one year, not too long ago. And uh, John does quite a bit of contesting in England uh, with, uh, with some of his mates over there. And uh, we've uh, also spent time together in Visalia on, on several occasions. So a lot of respect for John and his uh, contesting ability, a uh, great CW operator and, uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, knows a lot of folks in the contest community, which is how uh, this, uh, this all came about. So anyway, give uh, John a, a warm outlaws uh, welcome and uh, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Lee, for the introduction. And um, yeah, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is, I, I like these Zoom sessions. I've done uh, a few of these presentations over Zoom and um, it feels like being in Arizona, it really does, except I haven't had to pay for the airfare, which is the bonus. So uh, I will try and limit this to 45 minutes, though uh, there's probably a bit of leeway on that, isn't there now? Um, save, we're all muted, so I suggest that we save questions to the end. I'm quite happy to take questions. That's uh, not a problem. So make a note of anything you want to ask and um, we'll do Q&A at the end. So yeah, this, this presentation is about the ARRL CWDX contest, which happened in February this year. We were very lucky to managed to, to go over there just before COVID set in. And this is the, the story of our trip and how it came about and how the contest went. And uh, yeah, just a, a little credit to Lee there for having put these slides together originally. Uh, uh, I've, I've been able to use this, these slides, which is good. Okay, so TI7W is uh, where we operated and that is in Costa Rica. We actually stayed in a town, well, a village town called Biagua. Yeah, um, that means two rivers, I think. Agua is, is water, by two, sort of two, two rivers. Of course, uh, Costa Rica uh, translates from Spanish as the rich coast in, in uh, English. It's got Nicaragua to the north, um, Pacific Ocean on the west, uh, population around 5 million, most of those, in fact, half of those in San Jose, the, the capital. Now, Biagua is, the, is where the arrow is, not far from the Nicaraguan border in the northwestern part of the country. San Jose is down south. Uh, many people, of course, go to Costa Rica on holiday. It's a beautiful country uh, with lots of tropical rainforests, waterfalls, Beautiful scenery, exotic wildlife, volcanoes, whitewater rafting, surfing, beaches, bird watching, you name it. It's a very, very nice place. Unfortunately, we were going for contesting and radio. Of course, we didn't see any of that. <laughs> well, we did see some, but um, I'm sure there was a lot more to see. Just uh, a, a note of uh, interest, in Costa Rica, it's, um, they, they very much promote the ecotourism and in fact 99.6 percent of their electricity is generated from green sources which is quite incredible isn't it and of course most of us will have had costa rican coffee as well so that's where costa rica is probably a, a lot nearer you than it is to me but uh, how did this come about well i was actually looking for options for the voodoo contest group uh we'd been to uh, West Africa for many years and operate from Cyprus and I think Kuwait by that point as well and I was looking for somewhere different and I knew that a friend of mine Mark M0DXR had operated from TI, TI5W as it used to be and I asked him about the chances of operating uh, the, the Voodoo group operating there for CQ Worldwide and he said well write to Cam. Uh, Cam's a very uh, approachable guy he, he won't mind drop him an email so I did that in 2018 and Cam came back and said sorry but the station's busy it's you know more or less completely booked up all the time he has some regular guys who go in they do their WRTC qualification from their 
because it's always a, a high performing, high scoring station. So, you know, these guys operate from there and uh, all, the, all the big contests booked up. Nothing was available. But then in what I would call the autumn of 2019, or the fall of 2019, Cam emailed email me back and said, um, John, the station's available for the ARRL VXCW contest if you want to come along. So I said, yes, definitely. And then I was scratching my head. Oh, I wonder who can come with me. So actually, I reached out to some of my Phoenix pals, Ned, AA7A, who I'm sure you all know, and, and, and Lee. As Lee explained, we, we go back quite a long way, uh, 15 years or so through the, the voodoo trips. And um, we thought, yeah, let's do this as a, 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 as a threesome. We, uh, with the possibility of Cam perhaps operating as well. And we, we started thinking at this stage, well, with three, possibly four of us operating, probably the best category to operate would be uh, multi-operator single transmitter. Yeah, we want enough operating time. Uh, balanced with uh, fun and um, you know it's a long way to go as well so you don't want to be hanging around you want to be operating so we, we felt three stroke four would be a good number so that was about a year ago wasn't it when we started thinking about the the uh, trip and we got our travel arrangements sorted out. So basically, Cam advised that we should fly into the, the nearest airport to him, uh, rather than San Jose. The nearest airport to him is a, a city called Liberia, the Liberia. And actually, there are direct flights from the UK, package flights, uh, package holiday flights full of tourists. But actually, uh, what I suggested to Ned and Lee was that I would fly to Dallas, meet them there, yeah, and we could do a stopover in an airport hotel, have something to eat and drink and generally catch up because we haven't seen each other for a while. And then on the following morning, fly down to Costa Rica. So that was the plan. And in fact, we booked our flights. Lee booked the holiday at Dallas Fort Worth, sorry, the hotel at Dallas Fort Worth Airport. And um, about the same time as well, we were applying for our licenses. Cam supplied the paperwork all in Spanish, which was a bit of a novelty, but um, uh, he, he provided, was a, provided us with a template anyway. So actually it was just a case of swapping the information out from the previous uh, applicant. So this was around February and we were all looking good to go. Uh, so, oh no, it wasn't, it was late December. We were looking good to go. Unfortunately, Ned had to drop out. Uh, he's had some personal problems to sort out. So it was just me and Lee and we did a check around some of the other Phoenix guys to see if anyone else would come. And our usual voodoo guys were unavailable. So I suggested a pal of mine, Mike G3WPH, who doesn't live far from here. We've contested together on RSGB contests. And um, we're also part of the team which won the RSGB field day, or national field day, as we call it, in 2019. We didn't have one this year in 2020 because of COVID. So we're still the reigning champions, actually. Uh, so I suggested to Mike that he might want to join us. And he said, yeah. Definitely would uh, love to join you. <laughs> so what Mike did was uh, try to book the same flight as me, but it was already booked up. So he managed to get on the following flight out to Dallas and we could uh, carry on with the same plan of meeting Lee in the uh, Dallas Fort Worth hotel <clears throat> by the airport and then <clears throat> spend an evening together and then fly down to uh, Dallas uh, to, to Liberia, Costa Rica on the Monday morning. So along came February and <laughs> this was the weekend before the contest. So we decided to go out a week ahead to, yeah, for a number of reasons, to uh, acclimatize, particularly for us Brits, there's, the, there's a big time difference, I think five hours. And I think even for Lee, there was probably three hours. The we wanted to familiarize ourselves with the station. We were hoping to see some of Costa Rica as well. Uh, we, and of course, we just wanted to run pileups ahead of the, ahead of the contest and uh, yeah, tune our ears into uh, the, the pileups and be in a good place when the contest came along. 
<clears throat> I traveled, my wife dropped me off at Heathrow Airport on the Sunday morning and it was blowing a storm. The, the trees were um, almost horizontal. There was all, all sorts of things blowing around the roads. Um, it was quite dangerous driving to the airport actually with the flying debris and so on. And basically airports were closed. So I knew it was going to be a challenge. And um, indeed, I met up with, with Mike. We, uh, fortunately, we were in the lounge and um, <clears throat> we just waited to hear the news of the flights. And indeed, my flight was cancelled. So I started thinking, right, OK, well, we'll wait and see if um, Mike's flight is cancelled or not. And if it's, if it's not, then I thought I'll jump on that flight. But sure enough, it was cancelled. So, uh, fortunately, because we were in the lounge, there was a customer service desk there that we could uh, go to and the, the queues weren't as bad as they were in the main concourse of the departure lounge. So we went over to the desk and we managed to get rebooked onto an American flight, which is a partner airline to British Airways, to connection, uh, to Chicago with a connection. So uh, that connection was to Dallas, so it meant that we would arrive in the States a little later than planned and fly down from Chicago to be in Dallas to meet Lee later on the Sunday evening and the plan would be back on track. However, Chicago flight was cancelled. This was quite a storm, it really was, and probably one of the worst that we've had for a while, uh, actually, although they are in increasing with global warming. Uh, but the Chicago flight was cancelled as well. So we managed to rebook again, and this time we were rebooked onto a Virgin flight. So we had to get ourselves across to another terminal, actually, in Heathrow, and then find the Virgin check-in desk. And they got us on a flight to Boston, but it wouldn't get us there Sunday evening. Um, it would get us there late Sunday night. And in fact, after midnight, I think. So it meant a night sleeping in Boston airport and a 5.30 a.m. flight Monday morning into Dallas. So what that meant was that the Monday evening uh, that we were looking forward to in Dallas was cancelled and actually Lee nearly didn't make it either because he had uh, some I think uh, staff problems with the with the crew and his flight was almost cancelled too so he was in a bit of a panic. Um, Lee incidentally was asked to bring um, one of the flex radios over for CAM. CAM station as you'll see in a few moments uses flex 6600Ms and he had a lightning strike in around November prior to the contest and sent one of his, uh, well, uh, he, had, he had a radio that uh, uh, stopped working after the lightning strike. It sent it back to the States and Lee very kindly volunteered to bring it back. So Lee was carrying that in a carry-on wheelie bag. It was a bit bigger than he thought, I think, but uh, of course we had our fingers crossed about getting that through customs as well. So, we successfully met in Dallas on the Monday morning, which was great. And we managed to catch the originally planned flight into Liberia, Costa Rica uh, on the Monday morning. So we were back on, on track despite, and I'm sure a lot of other people that day at Heathrow would have been turned away and wouldn't have managed to get flights. So we were very, very lucky. And at one stage, we did think that we might have to leave it a day or two before we could fly out. But anyway, we got there. So an uh, uneventful flight down to Costa Rica, the, the three of us, and we were met at the airport by CAM. Uh, Lee was worried, as we all were, about getting the spare flex radio through customs. But in the event, there was no issue whatsoever. Uh, there was <laughs> nothing was being checked, to be honest. Um, so, so no issue at all. Now we would, would be staying, Cam had offered his, uh, um, a separate property and which he normally hires out as an Airbnb, uh, a property, a three, three bedroomed apartment in the grounds of his house for us to use. And it's actually available on Airbnb if you, if you take a look, but he, he'd offered it actually free of charge, which was very nice of him, um, for us to use self-catering. So it, 
would mean us looking after ourselves food wise so um, breakfast obviously I could do myself uh, bangers and um, and uh, baked beans Fred you'll like that um, although I didn't actually buy any um, but we were doing our own breakfasts and, and lunches and we we decided that most evenings we'd probably go out to local restaurants although we did eat in a couple of times. So of course we, we went into the supermarket, first of all, it wasn't far from the airport, it was a Walmart and it was you know just like being anywhere else actually, just like a normal Walmart. So obviously two trolleys, the first one gets filled with beer and, uh, and wine, yeah. And uh, so that's the essentials sorted and then second trolley for the lesser essentials like food, but certainly water and uh, yeah, all the stuff that we planned on cooking for ourselves and we actually got too much of everything but I guess it's better than uh, not having enough. The journey to Cam's house uh, partially down the Pan American Highway which was, uh, which was quite interesting uh, that's very well paved but last, last, last five miles of the journey were unpaved roads very uh, outback countryside but uh, we eventually arrived at Biagua and onto Cam's property which is like driving into a little paradise. I forget how, I think he said 35 acres, I, I forget, but it's certainly quite a sizable piece of land. And he's just bought some other land actually for uh, another QTH. He, he, made, he made some money by the way, selling uh, a company. He used to be the president of his own company that made GPS tracking devices and supplied military and police and, and governments. Uh, for I guess a lot of undercover work uh, so he made, he made some money um, building that company up and eventually selling it and has retired here to Costa Rica he, he is American uh, and lived in the northeast somewhere I forget where he's a K, K3 call sign or N3 call sign and uh, his father was Egyptian hence hence his um, exotic name but um, he's essentially an American guy retired now down to Costa Rica married a a local lady who happens to be Nicaraguan actually who also spoke very good English and she was um, she was lovely in fact they're all very hospitable there was staff there as well who tended the gardens uh, and uh, cleaned the house and, and, and so on so you know it was busy there was stuff going on um, all the time and he was very supportive of local community he had some building work going on there as well also supporting local community uh, but the Airbnb cottage where we were was just to, uh, that's his house, incidentally. So on, on, on the left there, you've got the outside at the front, and then you've got an open plan inside with the kitchen there and dining room, and then off uh, in um, through, through doors in, on either side of that, you've got bedrooms on one side and and, and shack on another. However, we'd be staying in the Airbnb cottage for guests. In fact, there's two Airbnbs here. In the left picture there, you see the archway with the hammock uh, hanging. The left, I think, was a one or two, I think one bedroom Airbnb that he uses. No one was in it when we were there. And then the cottage on the right was a nice three bedroomed uh, apartment, self-contained, very neat, uh, very comfortable where we would be staying for the week. So we arrived on Monday. Uh, I guess the first few hours we um, were just acclimatizing and um, having a look around and, and so on and getting our bearings. And the, uh, yeah, we went, uh, we had some time for orientation. So this was uh, Mike and myself with uh, with cam showing us around now of course uh, this is what i would class as um, a very well equipped station in fact probably the best uh, certainly so2r multi one and possibly multi two station i've ever used for sure and if you look at the antenna layout this gives you some idea of um, of what it's got i mean really it is built for the awrl contest the starting uh, LF, there's a 160 meter loop. Now all that wooded area, in fact, everything you see there is Cam's land, I think. Uh, and uh, the big 160 meter loop, which I guess is up at about 80 feet. Uh, and the wire yard is at a similar height, maybe higher. Um, 
some of it is supported by trees and some of it is supported by the the really long spider beam fiberglass poles that you can get uh, i think they're the 87 foot or thereabouts so uh, yeah there's a few spider spider poles around and um some of the the the, the eight meter yagis are wire yagis as well so some of those are in the trees and he's he's got some drones that he uses to drop these wire antennas into the trees so pretty impressive you can see he's got uh, one yagi uh, eight meter yagi uh, northeast uh, northeast to the to the left more or less uh, and he's got one 80 meter yagi northwest so one on each u.s coast it, as i say it really is built for awrl there's um, also a pair of phased 80 meter verticals which are in the bottom left um, on 40 through 10 there's the opti beam uh, antennas so these are the multi-band the, I think there's two towers. You can see the tops of them there. I think they were 90 feet, about about 90 feet. And um, these optibeams are the, I think they're three LE on 40, three or four LE on 20, and I'm guessing five LE on 15 and six on 10. Um, and the whole station comes through, the, the, the towered antennas are four band. They come through quadplexes, bandpass filters, uh, and... Um, various switchings arrange arrangements so basically uh, out of either of the two stations you can select any any band and antenna it's quite an impressive setup so going into the shack this is the the full shack and uh, you can see there that we use the call sign ti7w in the contest cam uses that these days he used to be ti5w and um, actually I just looked at the UBN report that we got the, the other day, the error report after the contest, and it was amazing the number of people who logged as, as TI5W. We, I mean, we're, we were sending TI7W all the way through the contest, obviously, but a lot of people logged as TI5W, and I suspect that that is because uh, that's what the station used to be, and it was a call that people were very used to still. But the, 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 the number is original denoter, it's a, the, the region number, and Cam is on the border of five and seven. And what he found was with uh, five, that followed, uh, you know, following the I, that there was too many dots there for people to, to get it. And uh, he got a lot of busted calls. So he changed to TI7W so that there's not so many dits, though obviously that's still got its own problems. I must let him know about the uh, people still logging TI5W. But uh, you can see under the shelf a pile of ACOMs, three ACOM 2000s. Well, they're just spares. <laughs> um, they're, they're not in use. He used to use ACOM amplifiers, but found because of the heat and the humidity, they didn't, um, they, they didn't perform. They basically didn't. Um, I mean, the, the limit's 1500 watts, of, of course, and e even just at 1500 watts, so within their capacity, they, they didn't hack it. They, they just weren't good enough. So he's got some ACOM spares there. Uh, and actually, the amplifiers used were OM power amplifiers, which we'll come on into a minute. So if we look at uh, the, so on the right hand side there, you can see a big screen and you can see the two flex radios. There is a third that uh, Lee brought. Uh, back which we installed as well I'll go into that in a minute but the screen was a single screen with uh, which can be split into a virtual screens so I'd either you can either use it as one input two inputs or four inputs and we'll be using it as uh, with two inputs so the, the left side is fed from uh, the left station PC and the right side is fed from the right station PC. And you can see there on the display, we've got uh, the logging software, one on each station, which is dxlog.net. And um, above that on the left-hand side, you've got, it looks like the V7CC client for the DX cluster. And then on the top of each screen with the, um, the green and blue bars, that's the remote control software for the OM power amplifiers. So what we're able to do actually throughout the contest is monitor the amplifier through that panel there and you can see on the right it's putting out um, just over 1300 watts on 20 meters 
and that enables us to monitor the SWR, make sure that we're within the power range. Also on that screen, you'll see the, um, the windows for controlling the COM ports. I mean, the, the, flex, the flex radios are essentially PCs running Windows 10, I think. So the integrations are also done in software, things like COM ports and the, the virtual audio cable. So it's all very software heavy, which is fine, but when it goes wrong, then it's a question of restarting all the software. It's not a question of just rebooting and switching it, switching it on. There, there is a, a delay time to, to, to restarting everything. So we looked at the antennas earlier. Uh, the station, this is on CAM's website actually, but this is the antenna diagram. No, we didn't use all of this, for instance, the uh, Force 12 stack uh, or stacks. We did use uh, 10 meters, another 10 meter antenna, but uh, basically you've got the OB, two OB17 fours. So they're the 17 element four band opti beams uh, feeding through quad plexus. And then you've got band, band pass uh, filters and switching, stack match switching, uh, and um, ultimately you can switch from either of the two radios, you can switch any of the antennas. Of course, not the same one at the same time, but uh, it does allow you to do that. There's also beverage antennas on receive uh, on 80 and 160, which proved to be very useful as well. Sw separate switches for those on the uh, radio's RX antenna input so it's quite complex and you can perhaps start to, to start understanding now why we wanted to spend a few days there before the contest just playing with things and getting used to it and, and so on this is um, a picture of the om3501 so this is 3.5 kilowatts uh, potentially but it can was a stickler as quite rightly he should be that we stick to 1.5 kilowatts throughout the contest, which we, we did. But what it means is that these uh, amplifiers, and there was, there was two of them, the other one might have been an OM4000 actually, plus this OM3500. Um, but these were, well, they, they, they were perfect all the way through the contest. They um, maintained their output power and there was no snags with these. A feature of these amplifiers is that they are uh, IP, uh, you can you can uh, address them through internet protocol IP. So and the, the station very much hangs around an Internet of Things type philosophy, where con connectivity is through IP addressing rather than serial port or uh, whatever. So things are done through Ethernet uh, mainly and, and some Wi-Fi perhaps as well. So looking at uh, station one. So. What you see here, this is actually the left hand side. And in the contest, we had this as the second operator. So the run operator, as, as a reminder, we did multi one. So one transmitter at a time, um, but a second operator could listen. And you allowed six band changes per hour for, um, for working multipliers and uh, band QSYs, of course. So this is the left hand station where it was the assisting operator tended to sit. So you see the flex radio on the bottom right is the one that was in use by the, uh, the multiplier operator. You can see where those uh, lights, the yellow lights are the stack match switches. So that is where we could switch uh, between Northwest and Northeast or have both at the same time on, on the Yagis. We could also select uh, on a separate box somewhere uh, between the 80 meter verticals and the 80 meter Yagis. The, you can see the, the rotor control there, but actually we didn't use the rotor control all week. <laughs> we, were, we were beaming in the right direction all the time on, on one of the two antennas. And there's various other stuff there that we didn't need to touch, but we needed to know what it was because if the power was to go off and we needed to reboot everything, then there's a bit of attention to be applied to, to, to things. So, yeah, there was a big learning curve to, to, to be had. 
Now, the spare flex uh, where the TI7W label is, we had that monitoring 10 meters all weekend. We knew, uh, of course, our main competition would come from the Caribbean stations. We knew that, and the differentiating factor would be whether we had an opening on 10 and possibly 15 that they didn't have. And that's what we were really hoping for. So the, the, the flex radio on the top shelf there was tuned into 10 meters all weekend just to look out for openings. And our intention was to QSY to 10 meters during the contest if it opened, uh, milk it dry, work as much as we could. And um, yeah, keep, keep going back until, until we'd worked as much as we could. So that was the left-hand station that you can see there, the left-hand side of the screen. It's actually quite good um, having everything on. I think there was disadvantages and advantages of having one big screen. It did sort of, you had to crane your neck a little bit uh, to see the screen. It was so big. But an advantage was that you could see everything on the other guy's screen. So, for instance, if he missed something on his amplifier or... or um, on the comport window, you know, you could you could see that and alert him. So there was that that ability to cross reference between the two stations' um, views of the software. Uh, the right hand station, pretty similar. Um, yeah, it's a, a lot of the stuff there we didn't have to touch. We were mainly touching the uh, the radio keyboard the antenna switches between northeast and northwest and of course monitoring and software and, and logging much of the first week actually was set um, just learning where stuff is and also setting up the software so uh, dx log is um, not to be confused there, there was i believe an old long time ago a piece of software called dx log this is dxlog.net originally written by uh, 985k but um, now supported and run in the States actually, but um, it needed quite a bit of configuration just to get it going on the network, get spots coming in, uh, getting the right SCP files and all that sort of thing that you need to do. So I spent time doing that and also making sure that Lee and Mike were familiar with it because um, they, they were coming from N1MM and um, needed to to learn the tricks of the trade on, on dxlog.net. So learning the station, yeah, I mean, the worst case scenario is losing the power when Cam's not there in the middle of the night. So basically all the thinking was around how, how will we recover the station should it go off and we need to recover it and Cam's not around. But as I mentioned, there's also setting up the computers, there's, uh, making sure that the multipliers are coming through, learning about the propagation. And so we, we ran pileups ahead of the contest. Uh, I did about 800 contacts, I think. I think the other guys did more. But um, I was getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to get the European sunrise, and I would take over from Mike, who was operating through the European night on 160. Uh, and I would get up at the European, or rather UK, um, sunrise, I should say, because sunrise across Europe takes about four hours, four or five hours. But um, UK sunrise, I would get up just before that and um, warm up 30 meters or 40 meters and work a few friends back home. But it was all, you know, that's all about familiarity and getting to learn the station and know how to handle uh, faults. And in fact, even prior to the contest, I remember the flexors, they did uh, jam up and freeze. Uh, I think one of them in particular did freeze a couple of times and we reverted to an old version of the software. Uh, Cam's a beta tester for Flex. So I think he did have the latest version, probably a beta version on there. And um, of course we broke it. So he did revert to an older version of the uh, software uh, on the Flex radio. And that seemed to go okay. I think in the contest we did have a freeze and we had to run off the other radio for a little while, but we did get it back. And, and that's, you know, one of the issues with having uh, experimental radios, I suppose they are, in some senses, uh, with lots of change going on, of course. You're forever updating the software, and where you've got change, then you will bring in vulnerabilities. 
So we also start thinking about the tactics and the planning for the contest. So it's a 48 hour contest, obviously, three operators. So we decided that we'd do three hour shifts uh, and that would give us six hour breaks. Although, uh, although one of us would be operating, we'd always, always try and arrange it so one other operator was in the spare seat to uh, look out on the other bands, to uh, look out for malts, do QSYs and work those malts if necessary. I also mentioned the external radio and 10 meters, which was very, very useful. We're allowed six band changes per hour, so we talked about how we would do that. Of course, for you US guys, it's not, not for the Brits, but for the US guys, it's thinking in reverse for this contest because normally you're chasing DX. This time we are the DX. And uh, aside from the, uh, the, the uh, KL7, KH6, uh, it's the contiguous states that we're, and, and, North, and, and um, North American Canadian provinces that we're chasing. So it's his reversal uh, in Lee's mind anyway. <laughs> it wasn't so bad for us. And of course, we, you know, we'd been getting used to those antennas, northeast and northwest, and getting used to the software. So uh, we were all ready uh, for the contest, pretty well prepared. We, uh, we did, of course, have some lessons learned at the end, but um, we were pretty well prepared. And a um, picture of me and Mike just... Uh, configuring the station before the contest. We did have some time before the contest to um, get out and see some of the beauty of the area. And of course, it would be wrong to go all that way and not see it. I think we, we were hoping to travel out in the car and uh, see the local waterfalls and forests and so on. But we didn't really have time for that. And, and actually, every day it rained. It was just like being in England, but 15 degrees hotter. So, um, or even 20 degrees hotter. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a very tropical climate and when it did rain, it didn't last long. It just poured and then stopped and the, the air cleared very quickly. But uh, what we did do was take the opportunity to uh, explore round cams, uh, gardens and, and property, the, the wooded forest area that he's got there. Uh, Lee was quite taken aback by the rainbow eucalyptus tree. Uh, of course, there was lots of other flora, flora and fauna. Uh, see there the plantain, lots of other stuff, and some very old trees as well. One of the trees was 500 years old. I don't know if I put on the uh, on the slide, but Cam pointed that out to us. He's got a signpost next to it. And actually, for his Airbnb guests, he's he's built trails around. He's got two or three trails around his land that uh, take people you know past various points of interest so it's very interesting and very well set up in terms of wildlife we, we disappeared and was um with a, a three-toed sloth as opposed to a two sloth which um do exist but these were these were three-toed and that sat up in the tree for several days just not doing much which i suppose is what they do eating eucalyptus leaves and um, he looks like a fairly old one he's got a bit of a sore on his back by lots of it but uh, he just sat up there he was quite difficult to see actually he blended in really well with the tree as you can see but uh, he just moved on after a few days uh, we were hoping to see other wildlife i wanted to see some snakes and big spiders uh, and perhaps monkeys as well and we didn't see any monkeys for several days but we kept hearing, hearing these howling noises uh, like, rather like howling dogs or foxes and uh, then sure enough we saw um, a howling mon howler monkey one day in fact it was Cam's wife Bertha who, who pointed it out to us and um, there was a whole family there and that, that was there for several they were there for several days after actually and we could get quite close to them they came quite low in the trees and these are photographs that I took it was very easy to photograph them the little baby on the right and his mother on the left so that was very interesting and of course toucans which um i don't know if you have it over there but i i associate these with the guinness advert in the uh, certainly in the uk the guinness advert has a toucan on it like this so that was fun to see and there was um again i didn't see any of those for a, a few days but that when i found the spot where they went to then there, there was loads of them so uh, cam was 
very, very welcoming, as was the uh, family and uh, the, the workers. And, and Bertha had some of her family there as well. They even lent us uh, one of their trucks, which um, Lee put in brackets there, stick shift. I mean, for me, that would just be normal, of course, but <laughs> it, it wasn't automatic. But the fact that he was, you know, he lent it to us and said, do what you want with it, it was great. And that allowed us to go down to the shops downtown and do a little bit of shopping. Uh, to supplement what we'd already bought at uh, Walmart, and indeed one evening we had uh, we had very I think Lee cooked actually it was uh, and I'm still here to tell the tale. Uh, it was a very nice steak that uh, Lee did with some crudité on the table there that you can see, and it was all washed down with some very fine South American wine, and uh, yeah, that was very good. On a, another couple of evenings, we went downtown. There was a couple of different places to go to. There was a few of the tourists around. There was, you know, the odd minibus would turn up with like a tour guide and uh, between, in some cases, three or four, in other cases, a, a dozen, mainly European tourists, French, I think we heard, and maybe some Germans. So, uh, although it was, you know, being February, it was a quiet time of year, but I think you probably do get a lot more tourists in the, uh, the peak season. The food was filling, and you can see there on the right, the, <laughs> the, um, the dish, it was, there was just so much food. And our waiter, Mackenzie, good old Scottish name, uh, which he claimed was his name, I don't know if it really was, but um, he spoke very good English and we had quite a, a laugh with him. So, and we went down that restaurant a couple of times in the end. Food was very good, very filling, and they sold beer. So what more can you want? So, you know, that was some of the stuff uh, outside Cam's QTH and before the contest. Uh, some antenna pictures. These are the, um, I'm not sure they are clones, actually. I think they are proper OptiBeams because uh, Cam did talk about speaking to the German owner of OptiBeam. Is it Klaus? Anyway, um, they were fixed. Well, well there, were, there were rotors on them, I think, but um, he didn't want us to use them because of the, um, the humidity there. They, they fail and uh, quite easily, and he wanted us to keep them fixed. So one of the OptiBeams was on northwest, uh, and the other was on northeast. Actually, I reckon, having, having looked at the analysis after the contest, I reckon we, we could have probably got away with just one antenna pointing north, and provided it was uh, you know, wide enough pattern I think it probably would have sufficed but there were two and it did make a difference uh, when you switch between the two and there's some other hardware on the right hand side there there's some 10 and 15 meter beams and for the 10 meter monitoring that we were doing for activity to come up then uh, we were obviously using one of those 10 meter beams I'm gonna have to crack on a bit because I see I'm coming up to my 45 minutes but uh, there was a few other antennas around on there was a hex beam which um, I guess is for malt hunting we didn't use it he would use it in CQ worldwide I think there's the various fiberglass verticals uh, I think there the that was a 26 85 foot one yeah on the left there 26 meter 85 foot and he was using those to support the uh, the wire antennas the 80 meter Yagi's and the 160 loop as I said so yeah it came from that and, and actually um, Putting those antennas up in the forest or wooded area must have been quite a challenge in itself because there, there are just so many um, ants, well, ants and flies and things that sting, basically, mosquitoes. Uh, so that would have been quite a challenge. And uh, I think we got a few bites between us as well. So contest fr starts Friday evening, obviously, and um, midnight GMT. So normally in the UK, it would be, uh, you know, late at night, but for us, it was around 6 p.m., I think. So that gave us an opportunity to have a pre-contest dinner in Cam's place. Uh, he, he, um, he had a friend over, actually, or was that later? There was a friend came over at one point who was having um, lunch with them. And then during the contest, another friend came over. But um, we were fed well with some chicken before the contest and come 6 p.m., we were operating and, and actually it was me who kicked off I think uh, we decided that uh, I would do this and I think mainly that was because of the familiarity with the software so I kicked off Cam advised that we should kick off on 40 meters 
Uh, of course, 6 p.m. It's starting to go dark. It's not quite dark yet, but I can advise that we should start on, um, sorry, start on 20 and, and then move down. So there's still some life left in 20 and as it got darker, we would move down. Uh, so yeah, I've got some notes here now. So can advise starting on 20, uh, um, just stay on 20 for as long as we could do before moving down to 40 meters. Now we tried something which um, I'd used before, it was new to Lee. So Lee, Lee was my sidekick for the, my first three hour stint starting on 20 meters. And we thought we'd try something called partner mode and the software does support this. I'd used it before in the IARU contest where um, the HQ societies battle it out. In fact, we've had just one just recently. Uh, in the past, I've been on the GR2HQ team. And in the RSGB team, we have um, multiple stations across the UK, and we're allowed to switch from site to site and we can follow propagation. And what we do, we have listeners, people listening in to uh, our run stations from different places in the country. And we use this partner mode and what it does is it allows the remote listeners to type in in a partner window, which is separate to the logging line, but appears in the operator's software. Uh, it allows the remote listeners to type in call signs that they can hear in the, in the pilot that maybe the main operator is not hearing. Or, you know, if there's several stations calling and there's a weak multiplier, maybe one of the remote listeners will hear it, pull it out, put the call sign in the partner window, and then the, the op, main op, the run op, will see that call sign and go to it on the next, on the next QSO. We thought we'd try this and um, because, you know, the pileups are quite fierce. And we thought that the partner operator sitting next to me, Lee might hear stuff that I'm not hearing. In the event, you know, he was he was writing a call sign, the call signs that he heard in the in the partner window, and I was working and logging stuff, and we were just doing the same call sign all the time. <laughs> you know, so it it proved to not be very effective, really, because he was hearing what I hear. But I, th I think what that tells us is that partner mode is useful if your uh, partner is listening on different antennas or is in a different location, uh, and can feed call signs in but in the same shack on the same antennas, it wasn't really useful. But um, I moved to 40 meters after about 40 minutes on 20 meters. And the first hour produced 177. So it was pretty good. The, the next hour, the second hour on 40 meters, 199 QSO. So yeah, it was improving. That was a pretty good hour, 199 on 40. And then after that, I QSY to 160, eight, eight, well 80 and then 160 course uh, pulling out as many multipliers as, as possible and after three hours I handed over to Lee I think it was and I've made 542 cues in the first three hours um, so we were pleased and Lee, Lee made a further 500 cues so was, over the next three hours and that was just jumping between 40 80 and 160 of course no more than six band uh, QSOs uh, and there we have it, I've, I've written all that down there. So we were six hours into the contest and then, um, and then Mike came on. So after sunrise, we, we obviously started going up in frequency. We were hoping for 15 and then later 10 meters to, to uh, open. Uh, coming back to 20 meters after sunrise was a challenge because all the American, North American stations were beaming to Europe and couldn't hear us at first. So it wasn't until later in the day that, um, yeah, after an hour or so that they obviously realized we were there and uh, signals to North America got uh, much stronger. Uh, Saturday afternoon was the, the best hour and certainly um, best elapsed hour. It wasn't a clock hour, but the best elapsed hour. I managed 244 cues on 15 meters, that was um, that was quite a thrill. I had Cam sitting next to me, he was listening in, saying, come on, 250, come on, let's get 250, 250, we've, we've got to get 250. And um, <laughs> we did QS, we QS wide to another band to work a malt, and uh, that blew it, unfortunately. But you know, the malt, the malt was more important, but uh, that, that was a, a pretty good hour, that 244, quite an adrenaline rush and uh, Obviously, the operators on the other end were very, very snappy. I was running, I remember I was running about 44 words a minute, 
for that hour. And then eventually when it did quieten down, obviously I brought the speed down to, to, to match. 10 meters never opened on day one. Very disappointing. We kept our eyes on that uh, Spectrum uh, pen adapter all the time. But at the end of the first day, first 12 hours, first 24 hours, we had uh, almost three and a half thousand cues, three, three, four, three, eight, and 284 multipliers in a log. So we thought that was a pretty good start. But of course, we were all always worried about the Caribbean stations, what we were and, and uh, what they were doing, uh, worried that they'd be, say, having openings on 10 and 15 that we weren't uh, ha having at all. Overnight, rates deteriorated. But we did pay close attention to ATM 160 and uh, surprise, surprise, to our great relief on day two, 10 meters did come open and uh, we managed to work 31 multipliers, 163 Qs. But, you know, we didn't really know how the Caribbean guys were doing. Did find out later that actually they also had that opening and they, uh, they had one on day one as well. But as the contest closed, we um, had log five, three, six, five. In fact, I've got a shot of the uh, score from DX log there. We were, we were pleased. We were very pleased. We thought we'd done well. The radios worked very well. I think there was one little snag where we had to reboot the radio. I think we had a power cut actually as well, uh, where we managed to recover everything. So a couple of small outages. In fact, the, the radio failing wasn't an outage because we just ran from the other radio. The, the radios, the flex radios performed, well, I thought they were very, very good. They, you have to learn how to drive them. On LF, you had to switch in attenuation on 160. Uh, you didn't really have to play with RF gain much like you do on some of the SDR radios. But I was very impressed with the performance of those flexors. Certainly as good as, if not better than K3s. And, and of course, the pan adapter there is... Um, well, I, I couldn't do without a pan adapter now in any in any contest, really. Uh, they are so useful. So, yeah, very impressed with the with the radios, but of course they do have the overhead of, of, of complexities. In terms of the profile of the rates, you can see that 244 hour, um, which in, on, as, as a clock hour, I think it was 236 or something like that. Um, but you can see it went very quiet overnight. Saturday afternoon was busy. And uh, that's when 15 opened. Sunday afternoon, not quite as busy, but um, a, a, another daytime peak. So coming to an end now, of course, uh, we were worried all along about our Caribbean um, competition. And when the scores went on 33.80, of course, we were able to see. And we, we had a claimed third. And indeed, the results have come out since then. And we can see actual scores and claimed scores. So we came third, ZF1A had openings that we didn't, and P40L, uh, both stations closer to the States, of course, so certainly on LF have an advantage, and um, maybe that proximity as well was an advantage on 10 meters for the, for the sporadic heat uh, contacts. You can see as a group, we are very accurate operators, uh, and I'm amazed by VP5K and their um, accuracy, only a 1.2% uh, deduction is amazing. But uh, we were pleased with 1.9 and you can see ZF1A were, were similar. So we can be pr quite proud of that accuracy, I think. Uh, on reflection, uh, travel nightmare, but wonderful experience. Cam and Bertha, amazing hosts, and the you know the, the whole trip didn't cost us anything. Although of course we we did uh, bear gifts and and took them out for uh, meals and so on. Uh, very comfortable. We uh, of course had challenges to overcome in terms of understanding the the radios and the operating environment, the software, the hardware. Uh, but we we did pretty well. We uh, had a friend of Cam's come round on the Sunday. He works for a low, low, local power company, and in fact, Cam had had some previous problems with noise, which turned out to be a bad insulator on one of the power lines. And it was Freddie who worked at the power company who Cam befriended and has come friends with. And in fact, all that interference has been sorted out. So um, kind of a win-win because. Freddie's got very into ham, ham radio since then. And of course, as is a voodoo uh, tradition, uh, we, we went out, we actually went out for a meal and then had a bottle of scotch. A um, couple of other reflections that um, 
I've, I've come to mind actually while, while I've been talking. We used the uh, well-tested uh, post-it note pad and, pad and paper to uh, give each other messages about multipliers. Cam suggested that we really should be doing that in the software and that uh, you know, you've, you've got the alerting possibility in the software to flash up on the other guy's screen that there's a, a multiplier on a particular frequency. He, he reckoned that, he, and Cam's operated in WRTC and as a two operator setup, that's what they do in, um, in WRTC. He said it's far more accurate and, and efficient. So that's something for us to bear in mind. But uh, all in all, great experience. We went out um, for dinner afterwards down to Mackenzie's restaurant, Pizza Hut, and uh, there's Freddie, Cam's friend from the power company. Uh, of course, there's the obligatory team picture of our bellies, our beer guts. Uh, and um, that's Cam with us on the right. You've got Lee, who you know, with his um, Arizona Outlaws t-shirt on. I didn't Photoshop that on, honestly, for, the, um, for this presentation. Uh, Mike and myself on the left. So yeah, great, great, great trip. And uh, we'd love to do it again sometime if we got the opportunity. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And um, if there's time, I know I've uh, gone on a little bit, but I think I had the benefit of time on my side. If there are any questions, Lee, I don't know if you want to facilitate that.